Okay, well, we've got 8.30. We've got to get started. Good morning, S&P. Good morning. Wow, that's pretty good for a cold morning. And the end of, believe it or not, week number nine. So we're doing the Pulfrick effect today at the end of week nine. Just a couple of heads ups and a couple of announcements. Uh, first, I want to thank the many people in the room who are good enough to come out or who were able to find time in their busy schedules to come out and watch Dr. Ackman's talk yesterday. I thought it was a lot of fun. She was describing lots of phenomena that we've talked about here in this class. She mentioned the contrast sensitivity function, and she talked about how the contrast sensitivity function can show a regular improvement and significant improvement in video game players, which was, which was nice to see. She also talked a little bit about attention, and we'll be having some conversation about visual attention in the sessions that, that lie ahead of us. So thank you all for coming out. I hope you enjoyed her talk as much as I did. Okay, one other thing to give you a reminder about, and that is uh, here we are on the 25th of October, and so on Wednesday, which is going to be October 30th, we have an exam, and nothing particularly surprising about this. We do this every time that we have an exam. We have a file out on the S drive, and also out on Blackboard, indicating what's the format, what's the content, how to practice, and so forth. This is really the same slide that we've had each of the times. What does change here is just where the emphasis will be. The course fundamentally is cumulative, but we do have different emphases. And so the last time that we had a test was shortly before October 14th. Our first session back was on October 14th after that. So that's where the emphasis is going to be. But as always, we have issues that relate to such things as signal detection theory and different kinds of threshold measurements that we might have with psychometric functions and so forth. So all of that is cumulative, but this is what you might uh, focus on to make the best use of your time. And this, as always, is available on the S drive as well as on Blackboard. And I'll give you one more reminder of that on uh, on Monday. On Monday, I'll also have a handout for you because we'll be coming up on our next writing assignment soon enough as well. Okay. One other thing, you all got an email from me uh, because one of the students was good enough to point out that something a little bit unusual is going on. We don't actually have this item, which is Monday's item, in your course pack, nor do we have this one for next Friday, one week from today, in your course pack. These are going to be available to you electronically. I thought I'd try to save a little bit of paper uh, when I could, and Denison does very generously provide us links to these, and this actually is a clickable link inside of your syllabus. So if you have the electronic version, of your syllabus, either on the S drive or on Blackboard, you can click on that, and that will take you right to the article. And I can show you where those might be. Let's see. Try it like this. Okay, and that's the article. Uh, also, you have the link from me that I emailed to you. How many people got that link? And got that email? Okay. So that's what you'll be reading for Monday's session. And Monday we might be joined by some, some visitors. It's a, another perspective day. Uh, some folks will be spending the, the night before that. Sunday night I'll be at an admissions dinner with the parents. And then uh, hopefully that Monday morning some people will be willing to come into an 8.30 class and hear all about the top-down versus bottom-up control of attention. Again, a little bit related to what Dr. Acton was talking about yesterday. Okay, guess so that's where we're going for the next few sessions. All right. All right, does everybody have the, the set of handouts that we have for today? We have lots of toys to play with. We need two of these and one of everything else. We have so many demos to do today. I hope you'll find this enjoyable. <clears throat> okay, why don't we go into this and we'll start out with some conversation about the Pulfrick Effect. And we had the Pulfrick Effect supplement that you see here. How many people were able to <clears throat> watch the video on the supplement? Actually, it's all embedded in one video. Yeah, you all saw that. So, sorry for the length of that video. That was 50 minutes long, and uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, lots of information in there. But the Pulfrick Effect, I think, is absolutely fascinating, and I think that it has a very interesting physiological underpinning. That takes a little while to explain. So I'm glad we got to export that to video, and people have been able to watch that before coming in. All right, why don't we get right into it? Here's my, my toy, right, I've got this one going on, <clears throat> and maybe I can mute the screen just for a moment. Do a display mute. Okay, and why don't we see if we can get into position, as the video had told us, using these filters. So these are the ones that are polarized, we've done this before. Why don't we cover our right eyes first, and I think the best way to do that <clears throat> is left hand, as we're going to cross over, two eyes are open, so I'll get into your orientation. If you'll excuse my back, so here's our left hand coming over, and we've got our right eye covered. Two eyes are open. Can we just do that much so far? Okay. There is an inclination to want to close the other eye. Please see if you can not close the other eye. Two eyes wide open. Okay. And then just uh, we'll get there in, in a moment. We won't do it just yet. Now with your right hand all the way out here, can we have a right hand shaking way out to that side? Okay. Right hand is all the way out, and then we'll begin to cover this eye, and we can twist 
until we get to a good orientation, one that now blocks some of the light, as we've done before. If we've, we've worked with these things once before, but it's been a couple of weeks. Okay? We won't do two filters to start out with. We'll start out with just one. And as always, I'll ask you to think about extending this table hypothetically across the room, and I have a plane to work in, right? So what we'll do is first have you use no filters whatsoever, and I hope I can convince you that we have, in fact, planar motion. So without any filters, please, no, no filters yet, okay? Hopefully you'll agree this is planar motion, and if you're all looking at it, then you're all in the horopter. Who remembers hearing about the horopter? And what is the horopter? Yell it out. The plane of zero disparity. Okay, wow, this group showed up to play. All right, I'm going to try to swing this as evenly as I can. Can you please cover your right eye now? Uh, holding your left hand. Two eyes open, please. Two eyes open. It might be that, yeah, sorry, I'll try to get in between the two rows here. Okay. And hopefully, well, I won't lead the witness. We'll let you describe what it is that you're getting. Okay, go ahead. Uh, UN's got it too. Yeah, we'll okay, all right. So let's do it this way. I, I try to think of it. Imagine that I can take that clock just for a moment and spin it uh, into a different orientation such that now it's being held flat and I'm at 12 o'clock and Kirsten and Elise are at 6 o'clock. Okay? So if I'm at 12 o'clock and they're at 6 o'clock, okay, would you say that if, when you're looking at this motion, is the motion better described as clockwise rotational motion or counterclockwise rotational motion? You can put your glasses back on, put your filter back on. I'm at six, Kirsten and Elise, um, I'm at 12, excuse me. Kirsten and Elise are at six on this hypothetical clock. Is this moving in a clockwise manner or a counterclockwise manner? Yeah. Counterclockwise, okay, counterclockwise, right? Okay, now, if you hang on with me. Now, can I ask you to, how many people are getting counterclockwise motion? Looks like the whole gang is getting that, okay? I'm gonna keep this going. Can you switch eyes now, just still one filter and cover your other eye. Now you're covering your left eye. Two eyes open, please. Two eyes open. Okay. Okay, two eyes, oh yeah, yeah, it's okay. And Kirsten's checking me out, right? Kirsten actually moved her filter away to say, is he really doing that with his hand, okay? Right? How many people are getting now clockwise motion? Everybody's there? Okay. Now, people will say, well, I think Matthews is putting us on. Uh, he's not really, he, he's actually doing a little sleight of hand here. So why don't we do it this way? Why don't we have the folks over here, can you please continue to leave this on your left side? Okay? Your left side and your right side. Okay? Can we do it that way? Okay? So the people who are closer to the door, I called them left side people a moment ago, which direction clockwise or cl counterclockwise are you getting now? Clockwise. clockwise. And how about the people over on the other side? Okay, so I can't simultaneously be going clockwise and counterclockwise. That's not physically possible. Although physicists tell me that quarks can do that. I don't really understand it, but I'm only a psychologist, not a physicist. So, uh, and more on that later. <laughs> okay, all right. So now you can move back and forth at your leisure. Uh, you, can put, you can cover whichever eye you prefer. I don't care whether it's left or right, but only one eye at a time. And, you can and then maybe you want to look at it with naked eyes, so you can see that I'm trying to keep this as planar as possible. I'm using the edge of the table as my guide. Okay. Nope, nope. Uh, ha oh, hang on, hang on. Oh, hang on. Here. Okay, how many people were able to do that? They were able to convince themselves that when you change which eye is filtered, you change the direction of motion. So this is a bit of an illusion, right, because we know in psychophysics that the physical stimulus is always in one plane. The psychological percept, and of course we are psychologists, that's what we're doing here at 8.30, we're doing some psychology. Psychologically, this is now rotational motion, and weirder still, we can systematically manipulate the rotational motion by covering either the right eye or the left eye. So who's okay with all of that? Okay, all right, and all of that is in the video. We promised that would be the case, but it, it's, you don't have the filters on you when you're watching the videos. So this is a, a really fun classroom demonstration. It also works uh, at, at young ages. Young kids uh, will see this in museums. I bring this to museums and, and they get a kick out of it. Okay? All right, now we'll try the, the slightly more difficult version of this. We'll ask you to go back to covering your right eye. So if you'll grab your left filter and put it over your, uh, your left hand's filter, put it over your right eye. Right hand is all the way out here. And maybe you can just rotate those into place first until you get a really good darkening using your polarized filters, and then I'll give us some motion. Okay? And you might want, not want to make it perfectly black. You do need to have light coming into two eyes. This is actually a binocular 
psychological phenomena. So both eyes do need to be getting some light. Don't block it all out, but block it out a good portion of the way, if you would. Okay? All right, and hopefully you'll get a really, I mean, you need to be able to see with both of your eyes. So two eyes are open. And hopefully you're getting a really powerful swing, okay? Then if I can ask you for getting a really powerful swing, just pull away one of the two filters. And it gets to be less powerful, and then put it back on. And it gets to be more powerful. And I'll let you do that at your leisure. And if you want to arbitrarily crank up or down the difference, make sure that two eyes are open, Becca. And that we're, <laughs> okay, all right? Two eyes, and um, Emily, we need to make sure that your, left, your other eye can see as well. It's a binocular phenomenon. Okay, so two eyes are open. And you might pull away one of the two. This is always a little bit harder just because people have trouble manipulating the filter such that they can see it with two eyes, one eye grossly filtered, then less grossly filtered. How many people are getting that? They're getting an increase in the depth. <clears throat> okay, so you're getting greater depth when you have more attenuation of the light. And that's separate and apart from the fact that you can change eyes, right? And just switch the direction of motion. Okay. All right. All right. How many people got that? Okay, it looks like we all got that. So we did a couple of things. Sometimes physicists talk about this idea of a vector. A vector is an entity that has a direction and a magnitude. And we can change the direction of rotation depending on which eye we cover. And then we can change the magnitude of that rotational motion by increasing the attenuation or turning down the attenuation of light. So it's, it's all driven by how many photons, essentially, are hitting that one eye. Okay? Pretty cool. Pretty cool effect. All right. All right. So, thank you all for playing along. That's probably my favorite demo. I have a couple of favorite demos, and there's one or two more to do this semester um, that are really among my favorites, but I, I really enjoy the Polfrick effect a whole lot. Okay, can anybody walk us through um, what might be the physiological basis for this Polfrick effect? Even if you can't do all of it, uh, we had these items that might help you. I'll show you in slide sort of view what I had done during the Polfrick supplement. Those were some of the pictures. Anybody want to get us started on some of that? Brielle is going to get us started. Thank you, and then we'll go to Elise. Yeah, okay. Uh, a vector has a direction and a magnitude. Yeah, okay. So it can be essentially positive or negative, uh, if you want to think of it that way. You can almost think of a number line, Briella, and we can be way positive, we can be way negative. We can be just barely positive, just barely negative, and anything in between, right? So we can be, and positive and negative here arbitrarily might correspond to clockwise and counterclockwise, and this thing could be swinging way out at you. That's a big magnitude, or it can have a little bit of rotation, or it can have no rotation whatsoever, okay? All right, so a direction and a magnitude. That's a, that's a concept from physics, and sometimes the psychophysicists grab onto that. Okay? Okay, so um, anybody, maybe Harshidel, wants to begin to help us through this, if that's all right? Um, Post-trick effect is because of the phenomenon that greater intensity of light would induce a faster cortical response. Okay, this one, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, that would be because, I mean, there are different neurons that have different thresholds. Uh -huh. they are stimulated by different levels of light. Okay. And when you're giving a really bright light, you're increasing the probability that most or all of them are going to be illuminated. Well, we're all the way over here, right? Yeah. Right. Maximum. Right. So all four, we have four different neurons. Uh, their behavior is shown here. Right? And so now we've got all of them off of zero. They all start at zero firing rate. And we've got them all higher than they were a moment ago, but we might need a lot of light to do that. And a lot of light might be in our example, akin to what's going on in, as I started out, your left eye. Your left eye was not filtered. So your left eye is getting all the photons, so to speak, that it can possibly be getting, given the projection from the stimulus. So that's going to give us a lot. And then we can turn down the amount of light <laughs> that we're allowing into that one eye. And when we do that, we might be turning down the firing rates of some of these neurons. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. How many people followed that? That worked for us? Okay. Well, what's this business about the bathtub? Anybody remember the bathtub? Okay, June's got the bathtub. The business about the bathtub was basically trying to explain how um, like synaptic firing work between the dendrites. Uh -huh. Wherein the, like a synapse won't fire until it's been filled enough with enough neurotransmitters to cross beyond a certain threshold. Okay. Different synapses have different thresholds at which they'll fire. Uh-huh, right. So like though, 
your example with the bathtubs was basically trying to show the rate at which the like, different synapses would fill with the necessary neurotransmitters. Okay. Whereas some would would release more neurotransmitters rapidly, mm -hmm. others might be much slower at releasing it, therefore taking a longer time to actually find. Yeah. Great. Okay. Very nicely summarized. So a lot of neuroscientists, you'll, and for those of you who are going into neuroscience or some neuro-related field, they talk about many neurons as being integrate and fire neurons. We sum up, and then after we reach some kind of a threshold, we fire. Who remembers hearing about the all or none rule? In intro to psych, we even talk about the all or none rule. <laughs> okay. So we have this all or none rule, and before this neuron, if you will allow me, decides to fire, it has to sum up using the information that's coming to its dendrites. The information here would be chemical information in the form of neurotransmitters. And after it sums up to a certain amount, then it fires. Okay? And we can have a lot of neurotransmitter out here, or a little bit less, or a little bit less. There's a gradation there. And that's going to be altering the rate at which the summation is occurring. And we might reach the spiking threshold relatively quickly, or relatively less quickly. Okay? And when there's a lot of light out there, then we have a lot of neurotransmitter release, and we reach our spiking uh, threshold relatively quickly. What's following all that? Okay, go ahead, Becca. Um, so, in the bathtub analogy, would the low sensitivity neuron be akin to the bathtub with like four faucets that's on the far right here? Yeah, I was thinking that um, you can you might think of it this way. This is just the amount of neurotransmitter release that's coming in. Okay, okay. and in this case, a lot of neurotransmitters coming in, and this neuron, whether it's low sensitivity or high spi high sensitivity, is going to reach its spiking threshold faster than it would were it the case that only one of these guys was turned on, okay? So, so those two aren't. Yeah, these aren't actually, right. If this is, you can think of this as a single neuron and how quickly will it reach a spiking threshold, okay? Right. Now you can imagine that different neurons are, are attached to different kinds of plumbing and some of them have relatively weak plumbing so that even when all of them are going full steam ahead, if you're in a house with weak plumbing, maybe that's only a little bit of <laughs> water and it's going to take a long time for that neuron to get going. Right? Another one with really good plumbing is going to have the water flowing very quickly and that neuron will reach its threshold faster. Okay? <laughs> all right. Okay, that's really cool. So that's our Pulfric effect. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. I absolutely love this. A um, couple different ideas about the Pulfric effect um, that I, I hope you'll, you'll appreciate. So what we did was, going back to this very first diagram, we actually changed the lighting. Okay? We changed the lighting, and that changed the timing. Right? I'll pause there and see how many people follow that. Right? So we're, we're, we can change the latency to cortical response. The latency to cortical response is measured in milliseconds. Right? We change the timing by changing the lighting. How many people are following that? Okay, that's pretty cool, right? Light is one thing that physicists might measure. Time is something else that physicists might measure. And there seems to be, inside of our cortex, some kind of interchangeability. We can change the timing of events by changing the lighting. We would measure light with a light meter. We measure time with a stopwatch. These are different physical things, and yet somehow our brain connects them. Who's with me so far? Okay, now it's weirder still. We change the light so that we can change the time. But when we change the time, we actually wind up creating a retinal disparity. <laughs> and that retinal disparity is actually going to be a horizontal <laughs> retinal disparity. And it's going to lead to a depth effect in the z-plane. So we're changing the light to changing the time, which gives us a horizontal disparity that has a psychological consequence that's in the z-plane, not in the x-plane. Okay? So there's a lot of connectivity going on here among seemingly unrelated events. The z-plane is psychological. Physiologically, we had an x-plane shift, and that was driven by a timing shift. That was interesting, right? A timing change now corresponds to a, uh, a spatial change on the x-axis, right? And that's all driven by a lighting change, the number of photons that we're allowing into the eye. Pretty cool. And let's just see if we can get back, and we'll say a little bit more about that, to make sure people understand what students historically have found to be a pretty busy, pretty difficult graph. It's this one. Okay. We did this in the video. Okay. But this is what's going on when we had the filter before our right eye. This is how we started out today. Okay. I wonder if we can have a student maybe try to walk us through this. Anybody want to give it a, a whirl? Okay, thank you, Becca. Um, so What's happening here is that the motion, we're looking at the trajectory of the, um, the leftward motion of the swinging ball. Right. Okay. And your so right going, eye going to your left. Mm -hmm. hits the 
picks up um, if this is if your right eye is covered. Yes, your right eye is covered. Good. Um, if your right eye is covered, um, it delays the input mm -hmm. um, and slows the process from transduction to uh, the visual cortex, um, and that creates a retinal disparity, but it's, a, it's actually a cortical disparity. That's right. It's actually a cortical disparity because all of, the whole while all of you are looking at this thing, as I'm moving this back and forth, all of you are looking at this. So this is in your horopter retinally, right? but we're going to fool the cortex by creating the delay that Becca is speaking of. So the left eye is getting things as it normally would. The right eye uh, is providing information that's actually been delayed. Right? And so this is sort of yesterday's news. And it, maybe we can all do this together. Let's put our hands out. And we'll put them both at item number four. Right? Everybody's lining up with item number four. But then we take our right eye's view, which has the filter in front of it, and we move it back to space three, space two. Can we all do that? And when we have a rightward displacement in the right eye's view, would, is that crossed or uncrossed? uncrossed? Uncrossed. And is uncrossed far or near? Far. Okay, so the idea here would be that as this thing is moving to your left, this should very definitely be further away from you than it actually is. It's um, psychologically further away from you. Okay, and then as we play it the other way around, right, as it's making its way back, it's going to be nearer and further and nearer and further. Right? Just to make sure people follow that one, we can now swing this one over to here. Okay. Now let's do this one more time. Let's all line up on number five if we could. Okay. And now the right eye's view one more time is delayed, but now because the ball is moving that way, the delay is going to be that way in time. So let's go back to four, back to three. Is this crossed or uncrossed? Yeah. Crossed and crossed looks which way psychologically? Near. Near. Okay. So we're, we're, we're toggling back and forth between far and then near, and then far and then near. Okay. And that, that's this, this counterclockwise rotational motion when, when our right eye is covered. Pretty cool, pretty systematic. Uh, a couple of questions. Why don't we go with Owen and then with Becca, if we could. Uh, would you be able to uh, create this uh, effect, I guess, in nature, if you were to um, uh, cover one eye, get it really used to the dark, and then uncover it so it like, um, has a really high sensitivity, yeah. sensitivity compared to your other one, and then like, kind of watch stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. So can we, st can we change the adaptive state of the nervous system? Specifically, we might somehow adapt one eye, um, make it really, really sensitive. And then when you now take that cover off that eye and it's really sensitive, you might have a hastened response to that eye. And then you can see pulphic-like phenomena in stimuli that uh, are not even... Uh, you know, uh, you, you wouldn't need any cover for it. You wouldn't need a filter for it. That's wonderful. You would think that would work, and I would believe it is. It, it would work. I actually don't know that anybody's tried that, but that's a re that's very creative. Uh, wonderful. Becca had a question or comment, and then Elise had something too. I think. Yeah, um, I was just wondering if um, this neurologically, like this difference in time that we're seeing here, yeah. is due to the fact that your right eye is only. Uh, so to say, waking up the slower reacting neurons? Hmm. Does that make sense? Or yeah. is, it, is it just the processing? Like it's only the processing speed that's changing, right? Okay. Uh, the, the speed of the, um, the, uh, the action potential, right? Uh, when I think of it that way, the, the, the collectively, right? The transmission from here to here, which is what you were mentioning earlier, only that has been slowed. Okay. Right? And, and the way that we... Right. You might say that in a given individual neuron, we are slowing things down because we've turned down the rate at which the faucet is running. <laughs> that works for you? Okay. okay. Right. Okay. And Elise has something also. So is this a phenomenon that doesn't really occur in real life, like it only occurs in polarized filters? Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, okay. Um, do we have a colored filter? Uh, how many people have the colored filters in front of them? Okay. I won't need the witness. Let's, let's, let's see if it works. Uh, can you pick up red or blue? doesn't matter to me. And um, I, I can give you the answer. It actually doesn't matter how you attenuate the light. Uh, any of those tricks will do it. But yeah, why don't we see if, we, if this will work? Um, so I'll spin this. You can either use red or blue. I think that the polarized lights probably block more light overall than the red or blue. So this might be a diminished effect. But uh, is, is it working? Are you working? And you, you can change. And maybe, I don't know if red blocks out more than blue does. You can uh, toggle between those. You can try different eyes if you like. Right? It's really just a matter of uh, reducing the light in any one eye's view, whether you use a smoked filter, uh, a polarized filter, a wavelength-specific filter. Right? Um, 
your neurons don't know. All they know is they've got some neurotransmitter in front of them and they know that amount is being uh, amped up or amped down. Yeah, but it's a great question. Oh, sorry, that, that, I did end with a little bit of rotation there. <laughs> okay, pretty cool. So again, one more time, what fascinates me about this is we change the luminance, which is measured by a light meter. When we change the luminance, we change the timing, which is measured by a stopwatch. When we change the time, we change the space horizontally, as we see over here. Okay? So now there is a time-space correspondence, and that's what's going on physiologically. We, we've changed this horizontally. And then when we change the horizontal arrangement on the physiology, the psychological correlate is a change in the z-axis. <laughs> so we change the number of photons, and that changed the z-axis percept. That's pretty weird. <laughs> but it works, and it works very reliably. Please go ahead, Arshida. Is that any kind of disorder related to this? It, what, what any we, kind of disorder? Oh, it is, is there a disorder related to this? I mean, I would think um, people who have partial paralysis, one side. Okay. Either one side. Yeah. They could have something. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of a disorder. I have been told anecdotally that um, this is called uh, the Pulfric effect after Professor Pulfric. Somebody told me that he himself had only one eye. He, he sort of thought this thing through. <laughs> he had only monocular vision, I, I'm told. Um, so there's a disorder. I, I don't know if he ever saw this effect, and I don't know how truthful the historical claim is that Professor Pulfrick was, but, which would be even more fun, right? The one-eyed professor finds out, figures out that you can change the light to change the timing to change the x-axis space to change the z-axis space. That's pretty good for a one-eyed <laughs> a person who doesn't have any kind of physiological or uh, perceptual access to this. And that's pretty amazing. But I don't know about a specific disorder. Okay, anything else on the Pulfrick effect? Here's my closer on the Pulfrick effect. We'll see if this works. I get about a 50% hit rate on, on this each year when I do this. We'll go to this guy. Ah, okay. And so at the beginning of the universe, there was the Big Bang. And when there was the Big Bang, there was this tremendous release of electromagnetic energy. And some of you might know of the cosmic microwave background. Has anybody heard of that before? Cosmic microwave background? Okay. So what you can see is, uh, if you're as old as me and you are alive in the 1970s, we used to have antenna that we would put on top of our, our televisions, and they would pick up all kinds of electromagnetic energy, some very, very small fraction of which was coming from the Big Bang, believe it or not. There's this uh, radiating cosmic microwave background that just puts up static. Has anybody seen static on a television screen like that before? Okay. So some small fraction of that on a real television is leftover energy from the Big Bang even today. Okay? Now what we're going to do is turn down the lights. I'll ask you to, maybe you can use your polarized filter, and you only need one of them. I'm going to play some static for you. hope you'll look at this. Two eyes open. And this is just planar, but you might see some depth here. Okay? It might take a moment or two, but after uh, a few seconds, it might be the case that you get some depth here and you perceive something like a volume, and, people are, and then you can switch eyes when you, get it, when you get the volume going, and it might be that it even rotates a little bit for you. Anybody getting that? Getting some depth out of this thing? It's almost like it's a fish tank filled with, <laughs> filled with static. Sorry, I'll start that again. We'll let you do it one more time. And then if you change eyes, you might be able to get it to change the direction of rotation. Some people see that they get it as rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, very arbitrarily. And you can imagine then you could also crank up your filter and make it go in the opposite direction by varying amounts. Yeah, okay, so Harshit is getting it. How many people are getting some rotation there of some variety? Okay. All right, so sometimes when I come home from my jog and I've got nothing to do, I'll say, well, why don't I look at the creation of the universe, uh, which is, you know, the static that we have. Some small fraction of the static in that uh, comes from the cosmic microwave background. And that, that originated, of course, from the Big Bang. Uh, so I say to myself, why don't we look at, you know, the creation of the universe, and we can look at it rotationally, and I actually can control experimentally which direction the universe is uh, rotating in. Right? <laughs> I can make it rotate clockwise or counterclockwise, and I can vary the amount of that. So uh, I think that Big Bang is a lot better than the, the television show, The Big Bang. Um, this, this is sort of the geek's Big Bang, right? <laughs> okay? All right. That's my closer on uh, the Pulfrick effect. And the reason I came to know that is that the person I did my postdoc with 
discovered this phenomena, and he found that out just by doing mathematical computations of the way neurons would have to be working. He was a psychophysicist, a computational researcher, and also an electrophysiologist. And uh, he made some recordings in monkeys' brains that would actually predict that this thing would have to happen in humans by putting that filter over, and, and he showed it. So, uh, pretty cool. Smart guy. All right. Why don't we keep on plugging, and we'll go back to the next section. Oops, excuse me. And now we are up to some conversation about random dot stereograms. And here they are. And how many people have this handout? Everybody grabbed that one? Okay. Why don't we go back to our free fusing trick, and we'll see if we can get you to do a little bit of free fusing. You can grab one of these if you haven't already. And we did the free fusing the other day. We put this right on our nose, and then we go down. And we spend a little time trying to get those to slide one into the next. <clears throat> you can look either at the top one or the bottom one. And it might help you to pick up the septum just a little bit and move back so your eyes don't have to work so hard. Are you getting that, Emily, or no? Yeah? Okay. Em Emily, what are you getting when you, when you do that? Um, it looks like the area that is highlighted, well, in the bottom uh -huh. of the, the box, right. and highlighted at the top is coming towards us. Okay, right. So it's coming nearer to us, right? We'll see if others can get that. It does take a moment to develop this motor skill. We've done it once before, and I'm hoping that since you've gotten some REM in between now and then, that motor skill is actually slightly more consolidated than it otherwise would have been neurally. Is anybody else getting that? Anybody else able to free? Okay, at least seems to be getting that. This does take a little practice. It's a little bit harder when you're not really looking at an object. You're looking at, in this case, static uh, or just stationary noise. A moment ago, we were looking at dynamic noise as we ended the Pulfrick effect. You're not getting that? Uh, okay, yeah, it does take... I can't free fuse. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is a little bit harder. And one other thing, if, you're, if you want to try it one more time, you can hold the paper in your hand, and you might help yourself if you move it back and give yourself a little bit more distance this way. As you're moving it back, sometimes you can get them to slide one on top of the next. I try it like that. And don't be afraid to move your hand out, right? So that uh, as you move it out, sometimes the two will slide together. Okay, all right, why don't we, why don't we just see uh, what these things are doing for us. So does anybody want to remind us why these were an important idea, these random dot stereograms? Clearly, we didn't evolve on the plains of the Serengeti, free fusing with index cards, right? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Um, it explains that, um, that you can have um, this process of stereopsis occur before monocular vision occurs. Wonderful, right? That was really a, a big breakthrough maybe in the 1960s. We didn't know that. We always thought that you had a monocularly visible object in your right eye's view and the same monocularly visible object in your left eye's view. And so you had those forms that were available to you. So form perception, these objects that you could see, we thought had to precede stereopsis. I get form A in my right eye, form A in my left eye. I put those two together with those retinal disparities, and away we go. But here, there actually is no form right, that you can see monocularly. It's monocularly invisible. Somehow, these binocularly driven cells in our primary visual cortex can pick out the patterns that you and I can't see monocularly. And after it picks them out, it presents to us a form. And so now, the stereopsis is preceding the form perception. And that's why that was an important breakthrough a couple of decades ago something that we, we didn't understand about the visual system. It's pretty cool that it can do that. So all kinds of pattern matching must be going on in our cortex uh, without us having maybe direct perceptual access to it. We don't have direct perceptual access to what the form might be in here. And it could have been a circle. It could have been a word that's embedded here also. Who's following that? Okay. There's also this point about uh, field research, which is very important, versus laboratory research. Anybody want to help us out with that distinction? We've mentioned it in the video. 
field versus laboratory research. Okay, yeah, thanks. He was evaluating the statement that Gibson made that get out of your lab and yeah. see what's out in the real world. Uh -huh. And while that is useful, um, laboratory research allows us to identify principles uh -huh. so that you can isolate variables and see their effects. Right, right. There's a lot to learn about the visual system, and part of it is we do want to learn uh, how the visual system is operating in real-world environments, right? And sometimes we uh, raise some questions about, gee, does the laboratory work do anything for us? But the laboratory work can be really nice because we create these crazy kinds of scenarios. Uh, they seem crazy, but they do inform us about how the system might work. So uh, questions about uh, what, the, what is vision for might be best answered by a series of uh, experiments that might be conducted out in the field, right? That might tell us about the evolutionarily, uh, evolutionary um, uh, benefits or evolutionary abilities of our visual system. But if you really want to know how the system works, you might need to go into the laboratory, control the light very carefully, uh, rearrange the environment very systematically, and see if you can develop some principles about how these neurons, how we go from neurons firing to a feeling, right? That was the hard problem of consciousness, right? And, and that can be facilitated very much by issues in the lab, experiments in the lab. How do we go from neurons firing to a feeling? Right. Kind of a recurring question for us. Any questions about the random dot stereograms before we move on? Okay, why don't we try to do one other bit of free fusing, uh, and we'll go now to binocular rivalry. So this is an interesting case that some of you haven't yet experienced um, binocular rivalry. We'll ask if you could uh, use your index cards as your septum one more time, and maybe you could try to free fuse this one. So this is the handout that we're at now. And again, you might need to pull this back a little bit, but um, we'll, we'll see what kinds of things you experience when you're trying to free fuse this. While you're fusing it, I'll just remind you that we have wildly different images in our left and right eyes view. We have something tilted 45 degrees anti-clockwise in one eye and 45 degrees clockwise in the other eye. Some people, I think, maybe have already gotten so good that they don't need the, the index card anymore. Some people can just relax their eyes. Now, in this case, you're not going to get any depth. Okay? Depth will not arise here. We don't really have a given stimulus in the left eye that's also occurring in the right eye and just is displaced by a small amount. A leftward displacement in the right eye's view, a right, rightward displacement in the left eye's view. We don't have that. We have very different images in the two eyes. Well, let you, anybody want to explain what they're experiencing if you're able to fuse these? Thank you, Emily. Um, it looks like they're coming together, they're overlapping, uh -huh. but not completely together, and they still have their own distinct orientations. They have their own distinct orientations, right? So they, they do yeah. slide one on top of the next, but you might have imagined it could have looked like this. It could have looked like some kind of a checkerboard, right? I mean, that could have happened, but most people report that isn't what they're seeing. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I found that if like, I blink and refocus, the orientation would often change. Like, I'd see this more than I'd It's a very fleeting percept, right? It's a very, very fleeting percept. Um, June, did you have a comment? Yeah. When I do it, it seems as if sections of the two circles will disappear. Okay. Yeah. Right. So sections of the two circles will disappear. It's not like you always get this one is dominating entirely, and then this one is dominating entirely. So there is this dominance and suppression that can happen sometimes in the entire image, or sometimes just portions of it. Right. So in your upper right field, it might be that this one is dominating for a moment. That one flies away, and then this one's dominating for a moment. Right. Anybody want to remind us of what we said was going on in the Stanford lab? What were they? Anybody recall what they were measuring? The Stanford, M yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, they had people hooked up to an fMRI machine, and they had them click a button when they were um, uh, getting uh, percepts from one eye versus the other, yeah. and they uh, were looking at how the uh, brain activity uh, changed depending on which uh, image the uh, that's right. Very nicely described. So they would have you um, looking at one of these things inside of an MRI device, and they ask you simply to hold down, you know, maybe the right key when, say, you've got the 45 degree clockwise one uh, most salient perceptually, the other key, the left key, when the one that's 
anti-clockwise, uh, most salient, and, and so forth. And so you're reporting your percept just by these button presses, and they're, they're tracking um, that particular kind of signal. Anybody want to remind us what that signal was called inside of the MRI? There's an acronym for what the MRI measures. Bold, bold and, and bold is B-O-L-D, and that stands for? Dependent. Wonderful. Blood oxygen level dependent signal. And that's just based on the idea that oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood have slightly different magnetic properties that can be measured in one of these resonance imagers. That's where the magnetic comes from in all of that. Okay? All right, so that's pretty cool that they do that. If I can share with you, uh, I won't call it an anecdote. It actually is a, a published article. I think it came out in Nature or Science. Uh, and I don't have it this semester in our, our readings, but a, f a few years back, some folks were interested in this mindfulness that Buddhist monks speak about. And they wanted to know, you know, can Buddhist monks really control their thoughts more effectively than the rest of us can? So what they did was they put a bunch of Buddhist monks into MRI devices, and they showed them these rivaling stimuli. And they had the, the monks just report, you know, which one are you experiencing, just like they would for you. But they also asked them to, re to um, see if they could hang on to one of those percepts. Right? So if you've got this one going on and this one going on, you don't really have control over which one you're going to experience. It seems to fluctuate randomly. But if somehow you have control over your thought processes, you might be able to grab onto one of these longer than the other. So they put these monks into the MRI device and they have them report um, the changes uh, momentarily, just like they would for you. And what they found was that the, the monks were able to hold on to a percept longer than non-monks were able to hold on to that. And you might say, well, maybe the monks were just pulling our leg. Right? <laughs> those, those crazy monks, uh, maybe they're, they're just reporting, that they're, they're trying to make themselves look good so they hold down the button longer, right? Except for one thing. Their behavioral reports were completely corroborated by their blood oxygen level dependent signal. Okay? And you might imagine that you and I can't directly control that, but when they saw these protracted periods in the MRI signal, behaviorally the monk was reporting, yep, I've got this 45 degree clockwise now. now. And then when the monk uh, reported that there was a switch over here, that was corroborated by their, their signal over in their visual cortex. So it does seem to be the case that you can engage in some kinds of um, mindfulness uh, through training. And that, by the way, this effect was bigger in monks who had been training in mindfulness longer than in monks who had been training uh, less for less periods of time. So there is a measurable training effect there. Very interesting. And, and very cool that we can use binocular rivalry to get some insight into, again, the translation between the firing, in this case is measured by MRI, and the feeling, in this case something like a, a rivalrous percept. Who's okay with all of that? Okay. Those crazy monks. <laughs> okay. All right, why don't we do one more in rivalry, then we'll move on to our last idea. I'll turn down the lights. Can you put on your colored filters? to use the vulgar. And now, instead of making your eyes go crazy, this is more like what would have happened with the Buddhist monks and the other folks who are in the Stanford MRI lab. Uh, we have the colored filters work for you. It doesn't matter which is right and which is left. You can do it either way. All we're trying to do here is see if we get some rivalry that goes on. Uh, and I'll let you experience that for a moment. And most people report that it's a relatively unstable percept, that for a moment maybe the blue guys are dominating, and then a, a moment later maybe the red ones are dominating, and then it's kind of patchy. At some moment red is partially dominant in one region, blue in the other, and then that flips around. Okay? Who's getting some good rivalry here that this is a very unstable person? <laughs> okay, right? And so what we did was we put the most different possible orientations that we could. 90 and uh, 0 degrees are as far away as you can get in orientation space, and we have the colored filters do the work for us. And your brain doesn't typically get stimulation like this, right? Out on the plains of the Serengeti, your two eyes would be looking at the same thing. We wouldn't have a red filter over one of your eyes, a blue filter over one of the eyes. So uh, a pretty salient demonstration. Please go ahead, Becca. Are there any studies um, with kids, kids or adults with ADHD on um, how quickly this process happens? Okay. Okay. Because uh, I've heard a lot about, like, I don't know, I don't know if binocular rivalry would be the same as, like, I. Yeah, right, right. So the question was, has this been done in children or maybe even adults with ADHD, and might the rate of rivalry uh, and the changing level be faster. I actually don't know that that's been done. That might have been done, and I, I don't have knowledge of it. But if we can pick up on the hint that we might get from the Buddhist study, right, that if you, if you can slow down your thinking and become very mindful of each thought, then that's almost the antithesis of what we might think is going on in the ADHD brain, yeah. perhaps, right? So it might be that the level of 
of toggle is faster. It would be a good guess. I don't know that it's actually been done. A really fun guess. Go ahead, Harshida. Is there a reason why the red seems to be popping out or is displaced? Yeah, yeah there's no reason for that. There's no uh, disparity here. Um, it could be that you have a momentary imbalance, as we all do, in our visual system. Maybe uh, one is um, some of those neurons that are picking up the longer wave light right, might be slightly more sensitive or different in their sensitivity anyway. Um, but there's no disparity there directly. Okay, okay. Yeah, if I put the red ones on my left side, okay. they seem slightly to the left. Okay. Don't know, yeah, I don't know what that, it doesn't appear to be in the stimulus, so. It looks like a depth plane, right? <laughs> right. Okay. All right, I'm going to bring our lights back up, and we'll spend our last couple of minutes doing our final demo for the day, and that's going to be on motion parallax. Please go ahead. Um, I have one last question Sorry. on binocular rivalry. That's fine. Uh, Please go ahead. People with strabismus. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, I read an article about um, someone with strabismus reporting like a shimmering mm -hmm. effect in their vision. Is that because they're always undergoing this process of binocular rivalry because they can't... They can't quite bring their eyes together, right? Yeah. So we might have a misalignment of the eyes in strabismus, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, it might be the case that, yeah, uh, right now I'm focusing on Kirsten and now I'm focusing on Naomi, um, but you can imagine that if I do have strabismus, I really can't quite focus on Naomi in a typical way. I'm getting Naomi in my left eye and I'm getting a partial Naomi <laughs> over here. So I have to in encounter this rivalry at all times, right? Yes, yeah, so it's a good point. Right? And, and then, of course, you can, be, you can have that condition to greater or lesser extents and correspondingly you'll get more or less rivalrous uh, stimulation. Right? Yeah, great point. Okay, so if you remember what we did in motion parallax in the video, can you, can you put your thumbs into position? Let's see if anybody knows how we... Wow! Everybody's <laughs> into position. So we're going to make this a... Excuse me, Naomi. We're going to make this a two-thumb exercise. I have my right thumb furthest out. It doesn't really matter which way you do it, but I'll go with my right thumb furthest out. We're going to hit that M. If you can line up your, your thumb with the M in motion... Okay? I've got my left eye closed. I'm doing this entirely with my right eye. And then I'm going to introduce my left thumb at a nearer area. And I'm going to move back and forth. I'll let you do it too. Sliding left and right. Please don't do this. Don't toggle your head in an angle, but go all the way over, keeping your head straight and all the way back, all the way over and all the way back, keeping your eye on your right thumb, which is in the center. And while you're fixating the right thumb, which is in the center, you might notice that the distant M travels with you. It moves to your right, when you move to your right, you might have to keep some distance between your two thumbs. Okay. And then when you move to the left, that M comes with you. That M is following you as you keep your eye on the central thumb. Okay. Meanwhile, the nearer thumb, that would be your left thumb, seems to be moving opposite your head, if you have your fixation centered there. It's to be moving opposite that. So it does take a little bit of practice. Okay. But we're getting different relative motions, getting back to uh, Briella's question about the vector, we can have different directions and different magnitudes. We can have a particular item uh, moving opposite to us or moving with us. Okay, So those can be positively signed or negatively signed. And usually it's the case that the more distant objects are moving with us and they're also moving at a relatively slow rate, the nearer objects are moving at a very fast rate and they're moving opposite to us. How many people got that percept? Okay, all right. And then just to bring it all home and put it all in connection with what we learned about stereopsis, we just did an exercise where we were going from right to left, but if we could move our heads exactly 6.5 centimeters, then what would happen is we're basically moving our eyes to our left eye's position and our right eye's position, and we're picking up what the two eyes would have seen if both eyes had been open. Right? We we're picking up the stereoscopic difference, but now we're distributing our samples in time rather than in space. And with two eyes open, we have two spatial samples. With one eye closed, moving back and forth, we have two temporal samples or samples in time. But it's always the same principle. Right? Always the same principle. Uh, go ahead, Harshina. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could do the whole move 6.5, but you can superimpose the two images. Y you could superimpose the two images? Well, I mean, you could it if, if you just move one eye and one uh -huh. eye, which right. is what stereoscopic yes. depth does for you, right? Yes. It gets information from the two eyes and superimpose Yes, right, and tries to uh, extract from that some kind of meaningful pattern, right? Yeah, very much so. Right? So it's really another way of saying the same thing. Okay, so that was a lot, of, a lot of phenomena. We were talking about depth, and we started out the other day by having these chalk art demonstrations. 
And those were all monocular. We're ending monocular here. But we can also see how it's related to stereopsis, and along the way we talked about some of the challenges of fusing the two images in the eyes. All right, that was a lot. Thank you for a great presentation, uh, a great discussion today. And then if you would also, uh, please remember to do the readings for Monday. We're right on track with the syllabus, and you can choose to look on to the, um, uh, the website. Right? You can click on that link and do the MIT article on attention. On your way out, if you would please stack things up neatly, colored here, polarized in the box, and if we can have the index cards back for the next class. Have a great weekend. What was the name of that article about the, uh, the Buddhist monks? Uh, I can send it to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah.